All right, we're live. Uh, I was just saying we're down two numpties. I think Derek has been having Wi-Fi issues and Steve has like disappeared into some deep project he's working on that must be uh, super secret. So he's, he's not here either. Derek might show up, but we got, a, we got a, a guest though. We have a non-numpty hanging out with us. Jack, Lou, how are you, man? I'm great, thanks. Good to be on the show. I've been watching a lot. So how are you guys? Doing very well. TK? Can I speak for you? Are you doing well? <laughs> yeah, we're doing pretty well, man. Um, you know, uh, one one could say that that it's a conspiracy that last last time there was a numpty missing. Today, that numpty is back, and there are two others that are missing. One could say we're, the numpties aren't getting along, and we're just <laughs> kind of you know buying some time. <laughs> we will neither confirm nor deny that there is drama and all kinds of things happening behind the scenes. Um, Jack, I know you've got like a, at least from, from what I, when we were chatting on, uh, on Twitter, you've got like a pretty big announcement that you want to talk about. And I'm trying to decide, I don't want to like bury that, but I also, I have so many things I want to ask you about, like your history with Bitcoin and everything. So should we, should we start with your big announcement and then backfill or should we go, you know, start at the beginning? What do you want to do? Let's make it fun. Why don't we put a timestamp on it now? And then when we get that to that time, you ask me about it. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, when should we, when should we talk about the big announcement? Up to you. Okay. You pick a number. All right. Let's. 30 minutes like, in. What'd you say? 30 minutes in. 30 minutes. I was going to say 20. Okay. We'll go. We'll try to go for about 30 minutes. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to set a little, I'm setting a timer on my phone because <laughs> that will help me remember. So, Jack, I want to I wanna just start by asking you, because um, I've chatted with you and I've seen the stuff that you've built and like you've got some really, some really incredible consumer apps. I would say apart from Twitch, your apps are, you know, what your RelayX wallet and you kind of have like an app store in the wallet. And I know you have Dimely, which is connected to that. Like some of the, ba the best consumer apps currently on Bitcoin and they're built on, on Bitcoin SV. But I want to go back in time. Like, how did you first find out about Bitcoin and what, what's your background? What got you interested? Yeah, I'm uh, going way back in time. I grew up in a lot of countries. Just that was a time when the Chinese generation was able to go out. So my parents took me to Japan, Canada, US. So I grew up in a lot of different environments. And uh, I thought the best way to kind of parlay myself was to, uh, to stay in the global economy was to go work in banking. So I did that. That's when I arrived in Hong Kong in 2010. And I worked at Barclays for a few years. And um, it had a sense to me that the technology I was using all around my life and my friends were using, like iPhones, WhatsApp, uh, Uber had came out, had nothing to do with the financial industry that I was in, which appeared to be very similar to Liar's Poker of the 1980s. You know, we were just coming off a great recession. So everyone in banking was waiting for the next bull market and just keep on buying the cycles up and down. So I figured that there must have been something in fintech that was around, but I'm not a background in uh, technology at the time, right? So I decided to, with a, bu a buddy of mine, just jump ship and move to Silicon Valley without having heard of Bitcoin. Mm. And uh, we and that was around. just like that was just because you thought there's got to be all this tech innovation is happening in other fields. There's got to be something in the financial realm. Let's just go to where the stuff is coming from and find out. Yeah, most people would have been like, wow, I really hit the jackpot. I got this great sales and trading job. It pays well. I'm really young. I'm having a fun time partying in Hong Kong, et cetera. And let me just sit here and ride this wave, right, of finance. But I looked the, the, what got me to go there wasn't actually any article about Silicon Valley or anything like that. It was like I looked across the end of the row. So on the sales and trading floor, you have rows of computers and monitors, and you have a senior trader and a junior trader, et cetera. Uh, and I looked down the road and there was this guy, my boss, right? He was getting paid maybe 20 times more than me, but he comes into work now earlier, but to me, that life that I had to look forward to 10, 20 years down the line in this job seemed to be no different than the job I'm doing right now. So I said, I don't want to sit here for another 20 years, whether it's this, this bank or that bank or that bank. So I thought, be dumb, be young and uh just go and come back i lost your video for a minute <clears throat> no problem 
your mic went out for a second too, but it came back. So we, we got what you said anyway, um, while you're, while you're working on your video, um, what made you, what made you think that you were more likely to kind of get that lifestyle that you wanted by up and moving to Silicon Valley versus staying in Hong Kong or going somewhere else? Yeah. So I went there just to learn, to see what happened. It, it, it was an option. Obviously a lot of people at the time were going to take MBAs or something, right? Like uh, go back to school. So I said, okay, I'll throw some tuition money essentially to learn about what's going on. And by coincidence, I was take, I went to Silicon Valley and a couple months later, I took a break, uh, went back home to Vancouver and I came across a zero hedge article about Bitcoin. This is 2013 August. Uh, and I remember reading this article and I said, sh sh sent to all my banking friends, I said, um, this is the Bitcoin white paper. And I just read it. And everything I've been BSing to you guys about for the last three, four years is going to happen now, finally. Everything that you believe in, I believe in, TK believes in. I read this white paper. I believed it. And so I immediately find out another article that said Vancouver had the world's first uh, Bitcoin ATM where you can buy Bitcoin. So I went straight to that. I had no understanding there was a thing called Mt. Gox. There was a thing called uh, other exchanges or anything like the fact that ATMs were charging 20% fees. I had no, none of this idea. I didn't even know that Bitcoin printed out uh, QR codes or something at the ATM. So I remember going that day, that night to the ATM and I was stuffing uh, $100 Canadian bills into this ATM maybe five of them, right? About five, five, $500 worth of Bitcoin. So that was two Bitcoins at the time that day, right? And everyone around me in this coffee shop was like, are you stupid? Like, this is a crazy premium. This is like a demo, dude. Like, this is for like putting 10 bucks to see that you got some Bitcoin and take a photo or something like that. And then I said, okay, uh, well, too late. But what do I do with this thing? And I show them this piece of paper and they're like, whoa, 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 do not wave that around. That has your private key on it. So some fella waves me over and tries to show me something called blockchain.info wallet. And I, I'm struggling to download this thing. I, I'm always bad with phones. So like I, I, my phone was running out of batteries. I asked the copy owner for like a, a, wife, a, a, a battery charger. And then some other guy screams over and says, dude, that, that USB cord is like hacked. That's going to like read your private key off your phone. I, I've never met these kind of people in my life. Okay. <laughs> so I knew that day this was onto something. And so I never really understood the whole money making part. Hey, hey, Steve, I Magic. just thought this was such hardcore enthusiasts. And that day afterwards, I just read everything I could on Bitcoin, try to convince my co-founders to pivot out of the startup we were doing, which is some kind of simple crowdfunding Kickstarter type of thing. Uh, they wouldn't do it. And so eventually a year later, we shut that startup down. And then that started my career in Bitcoin. I love that, uh, <laughs> that you go to this ATM and instantly and this is this is what happens with bitcoin and this is why we need great easy to use consumer apps like you're building instantly all these bitcoin fans are telling you all the ways you're doing it wrong and you're compromising security and like no you can't do that no you can't do that no you can't use it that way no and like making you feel like this thing is it's like you're holding a fire and you're going to kill yourself if you don't do yeah. everything perfectly it's also funny because around the same time that you discovered bitcoin in 2013 that's probably, you first heard about it and then immediately went and bought some. That's around the same time when I kept hammering TK about how cool this was and he kept not taking any action at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think it took me about five, five years. <laughs> Steve, uh, I'm glad you could join us. I, I didn't know if you would. I, I told these guys you just have vanished into some kind of mysterious research hole or something. Yeah, well, I'm working on a book right now. I'm working on a book about big block Bitcoin. So it's taking my time. The, the real reason I was late is just because it's like the crack of dawn here. So it's, it's 920 in the morning. So I'm like, yeah, I'm well, a little it's slow. It's like getting midnight up for Jack. So <laughs> yeah, 20 minutes we're, we're all, it's convenient for me and TK, but nobody else. <laughs> um, right on. So, so you, what was the first, you said you quit your, your other thing and you went all into Bitcoin. What was the first sort of professional thing or business or startup that you did in Bitcoin? And when, when was First that? thing I did was uh, I wrote a blog uh, about my views on Bitcoin. Because I knew at the time that all these startups had no funding or they, if they did have funding, they were only hiring engineers or product managers. 
I wasn't going to have any of that background they were looking for. So the best way to get in, I remember writing a blog, applying to the Coinbase uh, custom support challenge that uh, uh, Olaf put up. So taking the Bitcoin test, right, for that, and then whatever it is. And then I was really lucky that uh, Jesse at Kraken, who was in building his business at Kraken uh, San Francisco, he had seen the blog, reached out, and uh, got my first job in the fall of 2014. I ended up only staying two months, and uh, Kraken was you know, going through some fundraising issues, and much of the early team had left. Uh, and I got a real big break when I got a chance to meet uh, Starshu and CZ. CZ was still at OKCoin at the time. Uh, and they brought me over to Beijing for the first time I came back to China to work. And uh, my career kind of really went off from there. TK, how familiar does that sound? Somebody wrote a blog post and ended up getting a job <laughs> offer out of it. That's like, like that's, uh, that's what we preach all the time at Praxis and at Crash that show your work, learn out loud, share your interests, and you, you increase the opportunities that come your way. Well, well the, the, the credentialist world that we live in teaches people to think about content creation as something that you have to become worthy of. So, so you become an expert first, and then you're allowed to talk out loud about what it is you know, as opposed to use the process of creating as a way to learn, like just Talk about what you're learning as you're in the middle of learning. Sounds well, like it's you. funny, especially in the Bitcoin space, any space that's really new and young. Yeah. It's so interesting how like, if you just are doing anything at all interesting, there's such a hunger and there's just such a, uh, it's such a small pond, so to speak that, I mean, Derek has talked about, he, he started blogging about some stuff and starts getting, you know, invites and free passes to conferences and all this kind of like, you know, I mean, we, we turn on the camera and talk on this show and, you know, we get a couple thousand views for, you know, just talking, just asking each other questions out loud. So it's such an interesting opportunity when you're, and, and even though it's 10, 11 years old, the Bitcoin ecosystem is still so small and new that like, just, if you're just observing it, why not just share your observations? And, and th there's so many opportunities that can happen. So so you went to Hong Kong to work for who? What, oh, what Beijing, Beijing, to work at OKCoin. Oh, Beijing, I'm sorry. Yeah. Got it. When did, you, when did you realize that there was something wrong with the block size restriction? So I, for the longest time, did not know there was a block size, okay? And I mean, like, maybe in 2014, 2015. So everything I was blogging about was, like, Bitcoin's been used for this, attestation this, uh, automated payments that I had no idea of the restriction, right? And I figured there was no one using it. That's why this hasn't happened. No one's building these apps. Um, and then I was really fortunate in that OK was one of those companies that because the miner, miners were all in China and then the exchanges were all in China, both sectors had about 50% market dominance back in the 2014 15 years. So when this topic became something that general people discussed, like users discussed, you know company founders discussed the block size I'm talking about. OK Company was very much uh, underrepresented. I might have been the only one who could speak coherent English. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did have a high title. I was representing the whole international business. But I got a chance to go to a lot of these uh, geeky forums, including the, the Bitcoin Skating Debate Roundtable, the, the famous picture that Adam uh, that the people partook in, in that agreement to scale to two megabytes. Classic came over and met. So I kind of was always following Reddit. That's where we got a lot of the exchange users from. So I was deep in it, for sure. And that's funny. I, I think Steve was the one who first broke it to me that there was this limit. Because I, I don't think I knew that there was a limit. Like it wasn't yeah. you know, or if I did, it was like immaterial. And when, when the debate started heating up, I'm like, Steve, what are all these people talking about second layer? Like, is that, I, I, I get, you know, just on a gut level, that feels like, like a concession. That feels like Bitcoin's broken and it only works if you build something new on top of it. I, I don't get this. Why, why are the blocks so small? Why can't it handle more? And Steve started explaining everything to me. And pretty soon uh, I realized, it would, I think you were, the, the part that really got me, Steve, was when you started doing two things. One, you were explaining to me, even with the current node situation with all these smaller you know, machines running nodes, 
you could still increase the block size by something like a hundred times and be okay. Uh, and, and then the idea of a non-mining node and explaining like, what does that actually mean? And I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is all a farce. This is like absurd. It was a, it was a strange, strange experience. Um, wh what do you, th so having more experience in China, we talked a little bit about, you know, the miners and in that, in that time when people were kind of negotiating, okay, let's get it up to two mags and whatever. Were the Chinese miners kind of just like really passive in that conversation or what's your take on why we didn't just get the block limit to increase sooner and it didn't come to all this stuff with BCH and, and everything? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I love being on the show with you guys because you know the context so we can go into the details of, of what really happened. Um, so I think when you talk in Chinese, and I did uh, to these miners at the time, they understand Bitcoin. They understand that uh, Bitcoin needs to scale. What they are didn't understand was that, um, see, in China, the, you tend to be a neutral position. You look at global politics, right? There are countries like America who's really bash, bashful, uh, com companies in, uh, countries in Europe. China likes to take more of a middle ground, not an extreme type of ground. So that's kind of a personality thing. So anytime you have a debate where there's three parties, right? One party that's like, I want small size blocks. Another party is like, let's go crazy. Let's go XT. Let's go plastic. It doesn't, isn't actually crazy, right? Because obviously Bitcoin should be unlimited blocks. But to the perspective of potentially the Chinese kind of culture, it's like, okay, well, two sides who I respect really a lot are saying this, then we should kind of be considerate. So when you get them in a room or get them on a call, they're not going to be like, hey, hey, MF get out of the way. I'm going to hire someone else to code uh, the node implementation. Screw that. If they're not going to say that, they might think that, right? <laughs> so I think that was kind of what happened. And then from a business perspective, right, there is two risks, right? So from our risk, from you guys' political views, economic views, your risk is that, hey, if Bitcoin doesn't get to live up to what everything it can be, then we in our lifetime, or maybe never, will ever get to experience the world of a fully utilized Bitcoin. That's kind of a fantasy opti uh, optimization kind of risk. For them as businesses, they might have this desire to see Bitcoin become like that. They might, these miners owned a lot of Bitcoins personally too. So they have a desire for that too. But as a business, the problem was their income was coming from the block rewards, right? And it just happens that the price on very little utility had already surged to $500, $600. It had back in 2013 already touched 1200. So if you're making the argument that I need to make some potentially risky technological, technological moves on this, uh, the way Bitcoin works, then I'm not going to push the envelope against these people who have, who are claimed that they oversaw the blockchain people or Bitcoin core. They oversaw the entire development of Bitcoin from, 2009 all the way to this bull market so keep trusting us so i guess uh the miners took that view that uh you know we probably want it to scale and you do know that you know jihan was on the side of bch right so the miners do want to scale um and but they didn't then the other consideration they had was uh exchanges at that time there was no such thing as exchanges listing bunch of shit coins or exchanges listing forks. There had never been a fork. So from a business perspective, if you've already manufactured mining chips and you know the price is going to stay relatively high, even today, right, 2020, this one megabyte Bitcoin is still at $10,000, which is like 20x what it was, uh, $500 back in 2016. So from that perspective, it's kind of correct. Like don't, don't, don't like hurt the chicken, whatever that roost, whatever that slogan is. <laughs> The feet, <laughs> rooster that feeds you, or something. What is that? What is that? Don't, don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. There you is go. That, don't is that kill it? And that's definitely now the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they, they wanted to go, go to the exchanges and say, hey, look, uh, can you promise that you won't list an alternative uh, one megabyte version of Bitcoin if we scale this? If someone tries to keep the one megabyte version alive, the exchanges are also being run by Chinese entrepreneurs. So they were like, I don't wanna be massively political here. 
I'm an exchange. I'm not going to decide on behalf of my users. The users are going to have the right to both of the coins. And that was our position at OKCoin. So now, again, this increases the risk at the time. And so ultimately, the way I feel is that my misread of the situation was I thought naturally people would just lift the limit. It turns out that you needed almost every other coin to have surpassed Bitcoin core in technological capabilities until you got consensus to come out with the BCH. That's my story. That's, that's really interesting to hear. And I know we've talked about it on the show a little bit, and I'm, I've talked about it with various people in Bitcoin about the differences between the Western and the Chinese uh, cultures and how they impact the, like, the mining dynamics. So it's interesting to hear that. That sounds like generally the story that I've heard from various people on the, on the Western side discussing it. When you look at things now, um, do you get the impression that the Chinese mining community in particular is resentful and angry towards what happened with uh, Bitcoin Core? Or are they cool with how things played out because the BTC price is still high, everybody's making money, and, and it's not a big deal? I think it's been so far, so much time has passed since that time that a lot of decision makers at these mining companies have changed, right? You're seeing a huge battle at Bitmain between Jihan and the Mike Reed. And people have aged, people are less idealistic, people kind of just accept what it is. Maybe a new, ge new generation of miners think differently, but um, they just, they've already made other chips for other coins and they've hired head of the department for the sales of those chips. And so these, these companies have just become something different. And I don't think this is a topic they think about day to day. Uh, you know, that's- yeah, do you, you know, think it's that's... funny, oh. the thing that doesn't often get addressed, and I mean, we don't talk about it, that much either is that from a sort of pure business standpoint say you don't know much about the tech and you don't know or care that much about you know any ideology behind it or even just the big vision yeah. you're just looking at like a money-making enterprise that you want to get involved in those guys you could argue they made the right business decision and they've they've you know been fine the price is good the money they're making is good you can't prove a counterfactual, right? Like, well, if only they yeah. would have pushed for the block to be raised, we'd have this one Bitcoin that would be amazing and maybe they'd be making even more money. But when they look at what they're doing, hey, great, now we don't know. We're, we're not developers, we're not tech, you know, we're not investing in a, a one single tech. We're, we're just gonna let the market pick. We got a whole bunch of different coins. Some of them are worth a lot, some of them aren't, whatever. Like, we're just gonna support them as long as we're making money. That, that's a fine business decision, which is part of why I think it's so important for big block Bitcoin to not just be like, hey, we're better than BTC, uh, you know, store your value with us instead because <laughs> ideology, you know, why like you have to, you have to do things that literally can't be done right. on any other coin. Otherwise, there's no, you have no unique value prop. You just have a bunch of words and, and business people who are trying to optimize for profit, they don't care and they don't see it. You can't win with your counterfactual. Oh, if only you would have gone with big blocks earlier, you would have been more rich. Well, I'm pretty rich now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you think it's a problem like in your own personal viewpoint that the way the mining dynamics have worked, miners are allowed to not really care as much about the development of the coin that they're mining because of the block reward. So it's like if we have this whole industry where you have a bunch of miners that are like, hey, look, we're pluralists, not a big deal. If one coin fails, we're just going to mine another, or what it's not a big deal. That, that's actually not ideal. It would be better if we had more hands-on miners, like maybe what in the in-chain towel people are trying to do that are more invested in one coin. Um, they have to have some kind of other vision, though. They have to see themselves as not just a miner. They have to see themselves as, I am mining because I need to make sure this network survives because I got this other app, other set of companies that I want to build on. If all they know and they all they do is mine or know this, then it's hard for them to see it, especially, you know, it's easy for us to learn from the lessons that they went through, but you put me back into that first scenario i almost feel like i asked ask myself all the time i said because i could understand both languages when they're meeting right i was like you know i was 26 27 at the time i knew i wasn't the ceo of the company i was representing i shouldn't speak up against all these people who are again 
supposedly much smarter than I am, right? But I, I sometimes ask myself, do I regret not trying to do more around that time and screw what the company policy is, just go out there and tell people what real Bitcoin is, et cetera. And I come back to, I think by the time I read about Bitcoin in 2013, this thing was already finished. Because at, at the time I heard about Bitcoin, uh, you were also hearing about the Ethereum video uh, that it's Vitalik put out that white background video. He's talking about Ethereum introducing. We'll do an ICO three months later. I went to the first Ethereum ICO meetup, pre-ICO meetup, like where people were talking about, hey, just put 500 bucks into Bitcoin, uh, into Ethereum, it'll outperform, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. And then, so, because if you really think about it, you shouldn't need the block to be like semi-full or like, you know, half a megabyte being used for you, if you really understood Bitcoin, to be like, you could have, in month three, uh, said this thing could have this thing should be uh, scaled up. That the fact that the argument was even beginning to be started in like 2013, 14, as how far as I know, is already too late. Yeah, I think too. Um, there, this is I think Mike Hearn's writing on this was prescient, where he sort of says the same thing that it it the way he was looking at. It, I forget when he wrote his article the the failed bitcoin experiment but it, it did 2015 i think 2015 yeah yeah, it, it, yeah he, he was so jaded that it was like look this is the whole thing is a failed project because of this and i wonder i wonder too how well, many January 2016. Sorry, go ahead. 2016 uh okay. I, I i wonder how many people I, I i know i fell into this camp that it seemed so blisteringly obvious to me that you had to raise the block size limit if not eliminated altogether, like it, it, one megamite just do, is not on the table of making sense that there was a, maybe a faith or a trust that this is the inevitable outcome. And then we saw the, the miners signaling. It was like over 90% of them were signaling for segment 2X. And I was thinking, okay, you understand the dynamics of the system. There's no way the miners who are all running this code are going to back out. They're the ones with the power. And sure enough, the whole thing <laughs> still fell apart. You know, it's funny when you think of it like, okay, if I put out a, you know, a blog post or whatever, I blast it out to the world. Hey, uh, if you can build a computer that can calculate this really complex math problem, you'll get money for every one that you solve. Now you think about who, who would that attract? People who are like, I know some guys who are good with computers and I can put some money behind them. I did the math in my head and it's only going to cost us this much to process them. If they can get this, you know, GPU working, and then we'll make this much money. They're not asking, what is, what is the solving of all these math problems doing? What are you trying to build in the long term? If you're thinking purely as like a specialist. Now, I, very few business people are that hyper-focused that they don't put it into some broader context. But I think mining as a electricity goes into a computer that solves a problem and money comes out the other end. Or, you know, a coin comes out that I can then go and sell for money. There's not really a lot of reason you know to to go into these debates if you're if you're just thinking of it from from that highly specialized standpoint and so that's where mike hearn like he's right in a way that there's there's always been a missing piece from bitcoin it's like hey here's the 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 designers the coders we're all about designing this vision that we have for the world but the people with all the power, the miners, all they really need to be is self-interested specialists, except they kind of don't. They kind of need to be more than that, at least at first. In right? long, like, well, well, but in the long run, the, 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 the interesting thing is you play out how the system was designed when there is no block reward, which inevitably comes, and then you get a different system. You, can't, you literally can't have entrepreneurs who aren't playing the transaction processing game because they're not going to be making profit. I guess I'll, I'll make this point. If we could be wrong, by the way, it could be that Bitcoin is just supposed to stay at one megabyte and we're all talking a bunch of nonsense and it turns out it doesn't happen. And therefore it was correct that they didn't have this debate in 20, 2009, 2010, because we just stupidly started having this debate in 2015 and we're wrong. That's one possibility, right? If we are right and the Bitcoin was supposed to be on the megabyte blocks and the, the Satoshi had the idea of starting with one megabyte, then you must think that he knew that at the time. So I think the one regret that you could have, and you wish the you could explain, was why you start with one megabyte first and when exactly, what point does it unlock? 
Um, and I think my understanding of that from thinking about it is that economics work, economic incentives and capitalism works when there is a price. There is no price for Bitcoins when it first launched. So as far as 2010 May, when you bought a pizza for 10,000 Bitcoins, until then, you basically don't have a price, right? So even then, you have a price where one Bitcoin is only worth like a, less than a cent, right? Or a couple cents. So then on the first day, if you let people upload stuff that you do today on Twitch or the stuff that you do today on uh, whatever, then, then the miner is like, why would I store your cat videos? Why would I do any of this stuff for you? Because even if you attach all the blocks that have been mined in Bitcoin, like you mine the first 30 blocks, like, hey, do this. Here's like 500 Bitcoins. The miners like, I don't get that. That's worth nothing to me. And at some point, I'm going to shut the network down. So the criteria should have been as soon as there was a price, whether it was one cent per Bitcoin or half a cent per Bitcoin, that block needed to go up. So that, that is what was missing, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's historically correct. So these debates actually were happening from the beginning. This is the section I'm working on right now. This, on this is where actually. we need Derek with his uh, yeah, yeah. historical archival knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, the, Satoshi and and uh, Hearn actually was involved back then writing emails to Satoshi about this idea. And it was pretty explicit that, uh, well, originally, when Bitcoin was released, there wasn't a block size limit, then Hal Finney apparently convinced yes. Satoshi that there could be a problem that you just described, which is, maybe you could have uh, bigger blocks than miners uh, knew how to handle because there was no cost to transactions. Yeah. Gavin Andreessen also wrote a, a blog post about this saying it was like a dollar, it would have been something like a dollar 50 to make a block that's messed up the network because there was essentially no price. Um, uh, Ray Dellinger, who was another person who was uh, an early coder uh, on this that reviewed Satoshi's, um, code in the earliest days say, said that, uh, told this story and said that, um, Despite having the block size limit at one megabyte, both um, Satoshi and Hal and himself all recognized that it had to be. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve wasn't here, so he doesn't know what that means. I'll let you finish your thought, Steve. That means Jack has okay. got it. We're 30 minutes in. Jack has to make his big announcement, but you can finish your oh, thought. First. Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they all agreed that um, the block size limit was temporary and had to be raised in the future. And I, I think it was Hearn or one of the other early people saying that um, there wasn't actually, uh, it wasn't like the block size limit was this carefully crafted, very precise metric. It was just kind of a hack together thing because it was so obvious that this is, this system does not scale at one megabyte blocks that eventually it's just going to be raised. It's no big deal. So like the story you told and how you were imagining what it was, that, it, that's historically It was like correct. one of those classic, like, Hey, we have this unlikely edge case where someone could really screw things up. We might as well just prevent that. Yeah. At some point, we'll need to revisit that because that will become a problem, but let's not worry about it right now. And everybody's like, okay, fine. You know? Exactly. <laughs> I went back, even though I came in 2013, I went back and read every single forum post. I'm not obviously putting a book out about that, but at the time, that's how I learned about Bitcoin. And I remember coming to this thread that said, uh, guys, gentlemen, we are now like the new elite or something on Bitcoin Talk. And now it has like hundreds of hundreds of pages. On page like three or four, people are already saying, this is like 2009, 2010 like, thread. And they were saying like, yeah, this is gonna replace Visa and MasterCard with doing all these oh, productions. Yeah. So I thought it was like super obvious. I don't know what happened. I, I mean, Satoshi himself makes the comparison to the Visa network and literally says that it, Bitcoin reaches no scale sailing. Uh, scale sailing. He said, we can go many times higher than what Visa is already processing. Jack, what's the big news, man? Uh, so I'm Jack. Uh, we're part of a company called RelayX. And today we have acquired Streamanity in its entirety. So we'll be running Streamanity from now, here, now on. Nice. Hey, yes. So Streamanity, for those who don't know, is uh, basically a YouTube competitor, but with BSV integrated. The videos themselves are not hosted on the blockchain, but BSV is integrated as a, instead of advertising model and trying to become monetized, you can set like basically fees for people to watch your videos and do a lot of different stuff. So uh, what made you decide to buy Streamanity? Yeah, we're very excited about it. Um, so I've always thought Streamanity is one of the premier brands in Bitcoin. So uh, never really thought about buying them or buying anyone else company. But um, 
there was a blog post or a tweet that they had put out back in, I think, February or March about humanity's exchanging from a custodial wallet and we're looking for wallet providers to become uh, a non-custodial solution for them. There have been a lot of users who were, while looking to watch a video or uh, take money out of their earnings from posting a video, were struggling with the wallet that they were building, which is a custodial, only works on Shumati wallet. So obviously Relay, we, we said, let's, let's give it a shot. And we tried to submit our wallet as just one of many wallets, I'm sure, that were trying to win their business. And I think in the last month, one of our engineers uh, followed up on that and said, hey, how's it going? Is integration happening or, or what, what's happening? And I got uh, told kind of, hey, if um, you want to talk about sort of other ways we can work together. So that's how the conversation uh, evolved. And when the opportunity presented itself, I said, well, we have a lot on our plate because we were working on diamond at the time. And this is not, it looks strategic, but uh, it's, it was, we had a lot on our plate, but we said, look, this humanity platform, whenever we do get to it, uh, we'll, we're going to make it hopefully work a little better. So we took a chance on it. That's great. I love it, man. I, I'll tell you, Streamanity is like the interface is great. Uploading videos, watching videos, very simple, looks great. But it is, it is one of the few now that you have this ecosystem where, you know, you can get on a wallet like Relay and immediately from your wallet, go to Twitch, go to, uh, you know, Dimely, go to um, what's the BitPick, go to all these, you know, Bitcoin files. Streamanity, you go in and it says log in with Twitter or Google. And then it has its own separate wallet. And I'm like, I'm got, I've gotten so used to just using money button or relay across all apps with a single yeah. login and a single wallet uh, that just bringing that into that ecosystem, I think is, is awesome. Um, yeah. And I lost a dollar on that platform <laughs> specifically for this, for this wallet, this wallet thing. I was like, Oh, I'm going to try this. I tried to send a dollar and it never showed up and I contacted them and I never got a response. So I'm glad that that will be <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, your, when you think your about first order like, of business is to send Steve a I dollar. A damn re- give me a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> TK, what were you saying, man? That was the second big announcement that the company will be refunding Steve his dollar. To make sure <laughs> All right, I'm a supporter. <laughs> a, a, a rebranding PR move. But yeah, you know, you look at something like Twitch, man, fr- from the beginning to where it is now, you can see that those guys are constantly working on improving mm-hmm. the user experience accepting feedback, making things more, you know, uh, more fun to be on there. Streamanity has always been this site that's got a lot of potential, but there have been no improvements on the user experience. The same complaints have been made from the beginning. And I, and I go on there to watch some videos or whatever, but I just never really used it because it was so frustrating. It's like, is anybody running this? It felt like someone just created this. cut you off right there. Because yeah. I see that sentiment and has been emerged in the last six months for sure about Streamanity. I have to say, I had a chance to meet the Streamanity founders at the first Cambrian uh, in Bali. And uh, this is last August. Obviously, it wasn't talking about acquisition then. But it was very clear to me that Streamanity actually came into this market during BCH. Right? They launched when it was based on BCH. They launched when Handcash was on BCH. They actually did not have their own wallet. They actually built on top of Handcash. It was called Cashport, and Streamati itself was called Keyport. So we like to gloss and globiate on, on the Twitch features, but if you actually look at Streamati, you can say that are wrong features. You can say there are features that don't move the needle. Uh, you can say maybe YouTube is harder to knock off than, than Twitch or whatever else you want to do. But if you look at the, between Sumat and Shravan, the two co-founders, they took this platform exceptionally far. So I want to commend them for a lot of things. You're looking at a guy who's basically acquiring their company, sure, but we actually, in many respects, really, in many respects, is an inferior product to what Streamati has put up. You know, if you have people complaining about it, right? That means you have people who want to use it, who see the potential in it. Yeah. So let's list let's, let's some of the features they built. They built clips, they built boost, they built sharing. They had embedded like sharing with like kind of a, a tonic powell like revenue share. Uh, they had basic revenue share. They had uh, subscribers and, and they were forced because of how extraordinarily early they were into this ecosystem that they, 
when Handcash decided to no longer for a period take a break from servicing apps and just drop that, that's when Streamatty was like, uh, I guess I have to be at my own wallet now. Um, and so I think it's a matter of timing, it's a matter of a lot of reasons, but actually I think the founders did an incredible job and I try to do my best to kind of convince them to kind of uh, stay on actually. Hmm. You know, I, I'd love to ask you a little bit about strategy because I think you have an interesting approach to consumer apps and this is something, this is where building a great product and having the right market and model, right? So you have people know about product market fit, but there's a, there's a great blog series by Brian Balfour called uh, product market channel model fit, right? It's really like these four elements. And I think that that was really eye opening for me because, you know, I'm building a consumer product right now with crash and we have, we have gone down this road. We started, I think much like streamanity with, we're going to build this massive thing that's going to compete with all these other massive things. And we're going to appeal to this massive market, right? Which is always the mistake, but it's so hard as an entrepreneur to whittle your vision down. And as we've gone, we've moved much more in a direction of consumer apps like Superhuman, the email app, or Twitch, where you can't even just go sign up. It's invite only. You got to request access because we're trying to hit a very tight market that we know these users are going to love it. And we're going to learn from them how to make the best product. And they're going to be the best evangelist for this product. They're going to make the product successful. And having 100 super users in the first you know, year or six months is better than having 10,000 abandoned accounts. Um, you know, and so that idea of like really niching down. So you've got your product and your market is to be tight. But channel and model, you know, model is the business model, the revenue component. But channel... It's like, how do you distribute to that market? And that's where I think the Twitch insight and your insight is the same is like, hey, look, let's not try to, to go to current YouTubers who are on YouTube because they must be getting something valuable from it, right? They're not bitching about it, or maybe there's things they're unhappy about, but saying, leave YouTube and come to us. Instead of trying to appeal to them, let's start with a market that already likes BSV, that already has a wallet, and say, hey, look, another app in your ecosystem. Let's all, let's all talk about BSV. I mean, Twitch was only t posts about BSV for a while, right? And then it right. slowly branched right. out and slowly more, and it's slowly building. But if you start and say, let's be the best video platform for BSV fans to start with, that feels inferior to pitch than to say, we're going to go compete with YouTube. But it's so much stronger of a foundation. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's something like that that you guys are thinking in terms of your strategy. Is that, is that fair? I'm just looking for a job as you married, I can tell. We <laughs> <laughs> got enough stuff going on, man. I know. I mean, we, we love to have you. But, you know, it's great already to have uh, the four numpties now on Streamanity. And so that speaks to that. Woohoo! Uh, that strategy. Um, and so for anyone viewing this video right now, Streamanity is already live and you can use Relay and you're going to be able to use Money Button uh, and to upload videos and, and pay for videos. So you don't have to leave your wallet ecosystem. Now, I will say that exactly. You're exactly right. So if it was just a matter of adding wallets, there's, trust me, these guys are sharp. These Streamanity and uh, Stravin would have just added these wallets. They had gone through an incredible two years of learning about what was working, what was not, right? And so it's definitely, it's not one of these things where, you know, I'm naive and, you know, okay, let's integrate Relay. Oh, woohoo, there's all these app synergies, network effects, done. That's not what's going on. But I agree with you in the sense that um, I, I make the analogy of, let's say a bunch of British people, which they did, uh, moved to America in the 1700s, right? And you're open, opening a restaurant uh, in New England, you need to care about how do you make a profitable business, a successful business servicing a very small population. You cannot be thinking, hey, can someone build a faster ship, a better onboarding like experience so that more people from England can come over to uh, New England, okay, to, to America. You cannot be thinking about that. You cannot be thinking they have this in England, but they don't have this in America. And then like, we're going to make this better. And then that's going to make people come over. That's not going to happen. You have to uh, initially make that restaurant, make that grocery store, whatever it is, 
uh, top of the line, first of all, enough to get the people that are living in your area to use it. And then if those people start dancing and other people start opening other businesses and they're living a radical, amazing life and someone comes along and invents the Henry Ford, invents the car, the automobile, then yeah, at some point America looks like a, a really good place to be and more people from around the world, not just England, will come over to America and, and live. So I think if your resources are very limited, uh, and we all are, whether you have VCs or you don't have VCs, this is talking about like whether you have a million dollars or you have zero dollars, right, or ten dollars. You cannot approach this like, let me go and build feature parity with Twitter, or let me go build feature parity with YouTube. First of all, even if you have feature parity, no one cares, right? Like, what does feature parity mean? It means you just build something that I already got going on right now with YouTube, right? So, uh, I think rather than hoping wallets get better, rather than hoping exchanges at BSV or on ramps get better, the strategy has to be, can I try and make the people who already have BSV have some interest? So your metric should be, how many users did I have out of a basket of total users in BSV? And then try to get, get that ratio higher and higher. So I think if I look at the content creators at Streamanity, and I know the stats, I'm happy to uh, read out some of the stats to you. Do you want to know that? I'll, I'll yeah, open yeah, go up. for it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Let me, open up, let me open up the entire uh, stats as far as I'm interested in. Total number of registered users, 3,187. Okay. How many users paid at least once? 1,599. How many creators posted at least one video? 418. You might think these numbers are bad. I think these numbers are great. Okay. <laughs> like that's how I think about it. How many videos on the platform total? 3,956, just under 4,000. I'll round going forward. How many videos got at least one person who paid for it? 2,600. And for people who don't know, Streamatic is a place where you do a micro payment. You don't subscribe to that person necessarily. You don't have to give them a monthly payment. You just pay for that video on the spot as you're watching it, powered by the amazing efficiency of Bitcoin. Um, so how many, uh, what has the top creator earned? Do you guys want to take a guess at this number? Like how much money did the number one creator on Streamatic made? 200 uh, bucks. $2,017. Damn. Wow. Not bad. T tell me why, why you said these numbers get you excited. Um, because I believe that like a lot of businesses, they are trying to get land that big fish. Like you just think you get this one partnership, one enterprise client, one mega celebrity to come to your platform. And it's just like a mix, mix of things. It's kind of like the New York Knicks trying to land like a free agent. <laughs> and that's their team building. Never works. No, I am a San Antonio Spurs fan. I'm a, a New England Patriots fan. Oh my gosh. You could have just yeah. led with you're a Spurs fan and your entire business strategy would have immediately made sense. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm out there drafting Ginobili the number 57, 99. I'm drafting Tony Parkin in 2001 with a 28th pick. <laughs> I'm drafting and stashing Tiago Splitter, all these guys. Yes, there you go. You know when you're drafting Tiago Splitter, you're a, you're a legit Spurs, <laughs> Spurs fan. <laughs> it, um, it's, funny, it's funny you mentioned, like, so with, with Praxis, my, my first company, you know, three, was it three and a half years in? after just grinding, 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 and always thinking like, man, we never got any PR. If we had like some big PR hit, and I'd see these competitors pop up and they'd have a big name investor and they get featured in the New York Times. Now, all of those when I ended up going out of business and Praxis is still uh, absolutely crushing it. Um, but I kept thinking, okay, that would be just such a huge thing. So out of the blue, I get invited to go on Fox News. I do this Fox News segment. Our website breaks, we get so much traffic, we get all these applications. But the number of quality applications barely increased. And like that gave us a huge bump and everybody, all my friends, all of the non-customers 
thought it was amazing and loved me more. My status was higher, but my bottom line barely budged. It didn't change customers. It just changed fans and fans are nowhere. They're worth nothing compared to customers, right? You can have every person out there think your company is so neat and cool, but not buy it, not use it. Uh, it doesn't matter. And so, you know, we got a whole bunch more work to deal with all the incoming stuff and a lot of crazy incoming stuff. And I'm not going to say there was no benefit. There was definitely benefit in long-term credibility and long tail and, you know, when people search it. But the impact on the bottom line was so small compared to getting on the phone with one homeschool parent and talking about the program and she gets excited and tells her friend and they tell their friend and pretty soon four of their kids are in the program. That's a bigger impact than going on national TV in front of millions of people was for us. I thought you were going to say, um, the, by contrast, you know, when you sponsor the Patterson and Pursuit podcast, then you just had an influx of high hey, quality. Steve, <laughs> we, we legitimately have at least one provable customer that came from Patterson and Pursuit. So right. they, they listed that on their, in their uh, application. <laughs> so Jack, I got a question for you. Um, you said you were in the CZ circle, and I'm interested in the, in, uh, the work that he's doing. I think he's been doing a, a bunch of great work as an entrepreneur, but there's obviously been tensions with CZ and the BSV world. So I'm interested, you're talking about, you know, building the product that everybody, you know, the, in the community wants to use, and then that's kind of a signal for other people maybe you want to join. I think that's a great strategy. Do you think that the bridges between this, the CZ world and maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe other, maybe CZ is the example and other, uh, other people that are really mad at BSV and Craig, do you think that those bridges are torched forever? Or do you think that lucky give it a few years, let it calm down, build great products and everybody will be, um, everybody who was saying they're never going to use BSV, it's a scam. They'll, they'll be eventually persuaded that it's a, a legit valuable project. Or do you think it, it doesn't matter? Yeah. Um, can I get to that after maybe uh, a couple more thoughts on humanity? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Fin yeah. Finish. We're never coming back to humanity after that. That's okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey uh, real quick, Jack, I, I just want to make this point because, you know, as a user, I'm never interested in the history of what technical people have accomplished with the creation of their tool. I'm just interested in when I go there, like how easy it is, how fun it is. And so I just want to make it clear when I, when I talked about going on streamanity and just feeling like, man, is anybody running this thing? It just feels so uncomp feels so complicated, but it's got a lot of potential. I, it, it's good to hear you talk about how much those guys have accomplished, but I'm excited about where you're going to take it next, because I know there are a lot of people at the level of users who don't really know or care about the history of how far it's already come, who are just waiting for this thing to, to realize its full potential. Because when you go there, you know that it's something special. And so I'm excited to see where you're gonna take it. I just wanted to make that part clear. Uh, thanks a lot. And I wanna just be obviously very cordial, cordial to the, the, the real founders of Shenanity who took it to here. And um, maybe I'll take some insight from these numbers and share what, what, I, what I'm thinking. So, you know, like, look at something like, um, you know, people don't know, Stefan Molyneux has posted videos on Shenanity. Stefan Molyneux, who's a big YouTube star, has also twetched. He is not the biggest player on neither Shinati nor Twitch because his audience cannot come over. They cannot get BSV. They don't know how to set a wallet. They already get to listen to Stefan Molyneux as it is. So you, you want to spend your time on the people who you weren't even targeting and happened to come to your product. Those are your best users. If you can't make those people money, you should stop trying to make people who are much wealthier or much more busy try and make those people money. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I look at some of the early, I can't name off all the amazing contributors of content on Shumani so far, but people like MetaNet TV, uh, Raina, who's done interviews with Craig, that's the number one video of all time on Shumani. Um, we have Daniel Kraywitz, of course, on, on Streamatty. Um, and so the question is, why is there even any content that's not on Streamatty that's about BSV? So if you can get enough people into Streamatty that only talks about BSV, at least for that category, and it could be cats, it could have been cats. If the onboarding problem was you needed to have a cat to make a video, then my strategy would be about cats. 
It's not because I love BSV. I'm looking at it purely as a business for humanity. Then, then th there will come a day where uh, there are more daily active Bitcoin viewers of streamanity than there are daily active BSV viewers users on YouTube. Once you hit that mark, regardless of whether this person likes streamanity, whether it has like playlist features or whatever other features that galore that you want to do, that person is most likely to go post on streamanity, and then you further entrench that lock. And then I think you take the conversation to a little bit wider which is people who already have other cryptos obviously can get BSV much easier than people who don't have any crypto. So why is Streamati not open to being a place to talk about Litecoin, to talk about whatever else? You should be secure enough in BSV as a chain that it scales that you don't need to have your product itself as a video platform have policies that are basically like, we don't welcome, uh, not to say Streamati did this, but I'm just saying we will be very welcoming to all kinds of uh, conversations. And that would be like the next strategy. It's like the example is Coindesk doesn't want to tomorrow start writing articles about the Middle East, okay, or politics or Black Lives Matter, right? These are very important topics. These are topics that have way more attention in the mainstream, that have way more article reads. But if you are Coindesk, your bread and butter, your next move is to talk about more crypto. So I get that the technology that we're building with Streamanity and in Bitcoin in general will way surpass YouTube, will way surpass any, um, and if it's not Streamanity, I'm humble enough to say someone else will do something that, like that. Maybe it's on chain, maybe it's got all kinds of bells and whistles. But as of right now, you have to take your go-to market strategy a little different. And maybe I'll pass on Streamanity to another entrepreneur in a year's time when uh, I realize all these ideas did not work, but this is what I'll be, what me and our team have agreed to spend our time uh, uh, trying. So how's that for you, TK? I, I, I love that. But before you, before you get to, because I do want to hear your, your thoughts on Steve's question. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, because you mentioned Streamanity was built on BCH originally. I'm assuming you were working on some, when the split happened, some BCH related stuff. When the BSV BCH split started looming, and then when it happened, what made you opt to go with BSV? From a from a from a business standpoint, it would seem at first glance, and it certainly seemed this way leading up to the split and immediately after, that the smarter business move for an app would be BCH because they seem to have more, you know, Bitcoin.com was there. They seem to have like a larger um, audience, but. I'm curious, like now it seems pretty obvious that you can do more on BSV and I can see reasons why BCH is less attractive, but at the time that seemed way less obvious. So I'm curious from your standpoint, what was your personal experience of that conflict and that split? Yeah. So, you know, these, I was actually the first person who listed the BCH BTC split, uh, an okay coin. Uh, did that with OKEX, a launch of OKEX in July 2017. Six days before the fork, roughly, uh, came up with a pre-fork trading product. And I thought, hey, I'm smart. Hey, what a good move by me, blah, blah. Now, now, now BCH is alive. Now the debate is over. And uh, I got a nice job here. I, I got responsibilities working on the exchange. My personal holdings moved over to BCH, but you know I'll keep this job and let let people you know now can build all kinds of crazy apps on BCH. Great, done. End of conversation. Then a year later, I happened to be you know doing a different job. I was doing a, a OTC job at Circle. I was kind of taking a break from you know breathing the smog in Beijing, etc. I was like you know having some health issues, so I was like I was just OTC. I was doing it with a friend, you know, printing trades, etc. Uh, and L Circle had bought Poloniex, okay? So uh, I actually, after I heard what happened in Thailand, was the first time I realized, wait, are these guys gonna split again? Is this, is this, what is happening right now? So I was on a year, end of year trip to Boston, back to headquarters, talk about 2019 planning or something like that. And I decided uh, to try and get this built again at Poloniex, a BCH BSV 
fork split product. And as you guys know, that launched eight days before the fork. So that launched November 8th and the fork, uh, split happened on November 15th. So I've always thought exchanges should be neutral, should list both, but personally, uh, con contra contrary to what you thought, I was definitely 100% in on BSV before BSV started this first block. What, why was that? Wow. Why was that? Oh, I, I knew the players involved. I knew that, uh, I, I knew that, uh, how can I say? I thought Jihan, okay, had made the big move with BCH, right? And by me saying I know Jihan and the people involved doesn't mean I had a conversation with Jihan leading up to the split. I just mean he was sold. Because you remember, uh, Craig had come out August, uh, July 1 or July 2, 2017 in Arnst, right? He had made this speech. And the first time he had kind of, kind of come back and made a speech, everyone was bought in. That's what led to the BCH split. Uh, and so I think Jihan and Craig were on the same team for BCH. Right. That, that speech was like Craig's best speech, by the way. Best speech. And that turned a lot of heads, right? And they're on the same team. But then I think, again, it comes back to that uh, pragmatic, business-minded uh, Chinese entrepreneur, right? And I'm not speaking just for Jihan or for anyone. I'm not speaking for Jihan at all. But I can sense that when you have smart contracts emerge uh, in a big way, ICOs in a big way, and obviously Chinese had a big speculative uh, culture, you started seeing features that were beyond just, hey, just scale Bitcoin, just scale, just scale the number of blocks. You have people probably in the miners' ear saying, hey, now that you have BCH, uh, BCH is your coin, just like XRP is Ripple's coin, and that's whatever your coin. So why don't you add, as like a pragmatic entrepreneur, add the best of EOS, add the best of ETH, uh, add the best of whatever. And so that's when I felt like some of the motivation for these changes that BCH wanted to take was basically the idea of, hey, man, we tried this, man. We went from one to eight to 32. Nothing's really going on. We're like number seven. Look at these smart contract things. These things are hot. Everyone in my company probably wants me to do that. So why would we not try that too? So, so I, I was not there in Bangkok right, or Thailand where they had this disagreement apparently. But I'm guessing the idea is why are you so principled and that you really want to keep on going to 128 and 2Gs and all this other stuff when you're missing the real market, which is all these people who want to do these token stuff. And I don't want to hear about this, the, the chain itself, be it Bitcoin's already like a uh, turn complete. The reality is there's these other things like called solidity that everyone, every dev wants to use and blah, blah. So why would we not add that? And We've already now gone past the fears of a fork because the first fork, apparently the chain was supposed to die. It didn't, the both chains kind of existed. So I think people were less willing to come to a mutual agreement there. And so I think that's why uh, you had this thing where uh, BSV wanted to go in its own way and BCH wanted to try these other features, whether it's anonymity, whether it's these kind of weird smart contract, easy to use smart contract templates. And so because I felt like what I understood about Bitcoin, what I bet my career, my life, my, my financials on from 2013 onwards was this original version of Bitcoin, you know, I'll let Jihan try something else. I'll let, I'll let the DCH go try something else, but it just makes sense for me to just keep on taking that road. So, you, so saw the, you saw kind of like the underlying mentality of the developers and the big supporters kind of being like shiny object syndrome, right? Like, which is why, uh, you know, it's funny. It's, it's almost like there's a, a mentality that you would expect to see in a very large corporation, right? So like when, when uh, Google tries to build a workplace collaboration tool, they, they way just overbuild some massive thing and they put in all these crazy features and it's unused. Whereas Slack is like literally just the simplest app you can ever build as a starting point. And, and I, I'm just, it's weird that BCH is this, is, you know, the, the plucky, they, they rebel against the, you know, core guys. And, and yet they, there's sort of this culture of like, we need to be everything. We need to, we need to, you know, chase all these shiny objects or like they're, they're jealous of all these other, it's, it's weird. There's just like, you would think it would be the opposite. You would think it'd be like big blocks. That's what we're here for. We've got the, the basics down. They already work. Big blocks is it. But 
but somehow that's that's not there. That's a that's a really interesting insight that you feel like they were kind of envious of what they see some of these altcoins kind of getting getting a bunch of buzz and and temporary attention. Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about it, BCH was small, but Bitmain was very large. Other companies in China were very large. They had like a thousand employees, two thousand employees, and they have very capable team members. So to their perspective, it's like who cares about solidity? Like this, this stuff is like easy. I could add that to like BCH in a day or something like this. Like, why are we so stubborn? Why are we not adding these features that people obviously want? Maybe we can raise the block size later because they just haven't seen anything. Uh, you can make the argument like, why do we care about Genesis when two gigs is plenty enough and no one's using it, blah, blah, But I'm, I'm very glad that we went with the full scale. Um, and so my mindset kind of changed. So I had done the exchange stuff. I had done this like other job with Circle. Uh, and I had done this twice uh, with listing kind of both coins and whatever and feeling like I could should do something. But if my wealth was going to be somewhat tied to the future of BTC, then BCH, then BSV, and this is like a third chance. And if you look actually at what's happening, right? The coin price at the time of the first fork was like six hundred dollars or something like that, uh, and when it, when BCH came out, it was like two hundred dollars. Or sorry, sorry, maybe it was like uh, I mean, sorry, maybe it's like two thousand dollars, two thousand dollars for BTC, and when it came out, like BCH was like three hundred something like that, right? And then when BCH became BSV, it was it was trading at like 600 and then the thing split off and uh, BCH goes to 250, 300 and BSV is like $50. Okay. So I'm in this coin. Yeah, sure. I believe in this. Sure. Yeah. I get more units of this thing, but at some point it's not about getting more units. It's like the, the project I want to succeed objectively speaking by market cap, not by potential fantasy potential is like dropping and if it splits again, sure, you can list it on some other exchange again, but like it might be $12, okay? So I'm not gonna buy into anybody telling me this will never split again, we're all on the same team, kumbaya, just watch it. I wasn't gonna go for that again. So I said, I don't know if I can build good apps because I have played more of a strategy business development role at these companies in crypto. Uh, Cause again, you're talking to a guy who in 2013 didn't understand these paper wallets stuff, okay? So I said, but I owe it to my kind of, before I exit this space entirely, just like kind of what Roger said, right? He's getting a little burnt out. He's not sure he's gonna keep doing this. So I said, I'm gonna do everything I could do uh, and grab as many friends I have in, in crypto to try and do this with me. And uh, that's what made me, got me building apps. All right, I wanna get to Steve's question now. I'll, 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 re, uh, I'll redo it. So um, the question is, do you, are you concerned that the bridges have been burned between the BSV network and big and relevant players like people like CZ who are doing, who, who do create a lot of value in the crypto industry? Or is it something you're not really worried about? Whether or not they come on board or not is their problem. It doesn't really affect BSV. I am not worried about the bridges being burned for a couple of reasons. And I don't think the bridges, well, even if they say the bridges have been burned, the people can change their mind pretty quickly. So um, if, you, if you look at, if you look at what's happening, right? Predominantly BSV was a Calvin, CoinGeek uh, dominated perception wise, especially when it started. Right? So if you have someone who's really against that for some reason, personal reasons, because they're suing me or something, sure, I understand that. But at some point, whether it's not this year or it's 20 years from now, at some point that organization, and same with our organization, is not going to be of any relevance uh, as it is today. So just as time goes on, that will happen. It's just like, is Visa against Bitcoin? Yeah, they are in 2010. At some point now, they're like joining Libra and trying to do different things and do crypto. So on a long enough timeline, this stuff will not matter. And then I also think if you want to bring those guys back in faster, you have to show them that uh, this chain is doing incredibly well, that they can't uh, miss out. So if Binance has delisted BSC, which they have, right? And right now they're missing out on basically the trading of the number five asset, 
in this space. Okay, maybe they, they, they don't care about that. Well, if this asset is a number two asset in the space, then no matter how good the exchange is, you got DEX, you got futures, leverage, all this stuff. If your exchange is missing something I need, I need to trade, if your exchange is now missing not just BSV, but 100 tokens on BSV, okay, then everyone at his company or CZ himself or any other entrepreneur himself will be like, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to add uh, BSV. And whether we welcome him to add BSV or we like get out, stay out, you, this is not for you, it doesn't matter. This is what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I think did, that's generally didn't correct. Did Binance just uh, start Sorry, mining BSV? <laughs> yeah, does, has, has anyone Is that confirmed that publicly? No? I don't know. No, uh, uh, so, so another difficult uh, question on this topic. Um, so I, I think what you said is correct. I, I just think that the, the anger and bitterness motivation is not as strong a motivation in the long run as the profit motive. Like eventually I think people will come around if there's profit to come around. But it's not just the, the, the personal bitterness. It's also like you have to acknowledge BSV that Craig Wright has a lot of influence uh, at the very least, over the network. And then I just watched a, I watched an interview with Ryan Charles the other day that was a very good interview with Craig and said a lot of reasonable things. And near the end of it, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he started saying that he owns the Bitcoin database. Sorry, folks, I just own the Bitcoin database, all the forks. You can create a new coin and uh, that's fine. But like if it's Bitcoin, I own the database. So because this is such a prominent person who obviously makes a lot of people mad and then he comes out and says these things and he's actually trying to get a lot, you know, he's involved in the legal system and he's suing people and trying to shape things through law. Do you have the concern that that, even if people like Craig, that that could be a legitimate problem if somebody is going out there saying that they own the entire Bitcoin database and, and might try to use the law to enforce that. Like, do you worry about that as an entrepreneur? No, because I'm not at a point where my business is so big that it would get wiped out or something by that. Right. So for example, if streamanity works, right, then yeah, if that happens, we can switch over to BCH. Okay. But it hasn't happened so far. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you look at empirical evidence, right? There are people hella worried, like you and I, about what is Bitcoin like with one megabyte blocks. Millions of people seem to be fine with that, okay, as a future of BTC, and have bought this thing all the way to a peak of nineteen thousand eight hundred dollars, something like that, okay. And legitimate institutions are now building ETFs, uh, whatever custodial solutions in the United States, getting licensed. The government is handing out NYDFS stuff, so it's like. When you show me that that has actually happened and that has actually damaged it, uh, then I will think about it. But until then, whether it's you found a little bit of evidence that it might happen, or he, he has a sound bite that he says that, it doesn't really matter because unless you show me a better chain right now, I'm just not moving. Mm. In, 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 some ways, in some ways, you would be like the miners, right? Just like the entrepreneurial version of yeah. that. You're like, yo, this is where my bread and butter is right now. And I'm not so blindly loyal that I'm just going to stay here when it ceases to be profitable. If it ceases to be profitable, I'll go where the best opportunity is at that time. Yes. And that's the thing. When you are building exchanges, you want to trade the highest market cap assets because that's more notional for trading. When you are mining Bitcoin, you want to mine the blocks that have the most fees. And in this case, at the time, it's lots of block rewards. So that's what you're optimizing for. When you're building on um, Bitcoin as like a payment system or like as a like a uh, on-chain data storage system, whatever it is, then you need to optimize for the cheapest fees uh, to use the network, regardless of anything else. So you're exactly right, PK. And if we made it, it'd be very obvious, right? So if we made Streamanity something where, as you as you get to the end of the preview, the free period of Streamanity, and now if there's a price to pay. We popped up five payment options, not just money button and relay, but let's say we popped up pay with Ethereum, pay with Bitcoin Cash, pay with dollars, pay with BCH, pay with BSV. It would be very clear that if you pay with Ethereum, it would be more expensive because you have a bigger piece of two more cents or something going to miners or 10 more cents going to miners. 
So if your use case is like that, then every single person who has no dog in this fight, who has no clue what any of these coins are, are going to go Wikipedia and search what is BSV, how do I get BSV, because they want to pay five cents for that video. They do not want to pay nine cents to watch Ethereum. So unless you show me a chain that's two cents, I don't care about what Craig is, is up to. Well, so, so that, I think that implies that the, the best business strategy is to always keep open um, the possibility for switching your, uh, your, the chain that you're working with if necessary. But that's a cost. And like if, if you're trying to build a business, let's say the data storage model, which reasonably couldn't do on other chains, Maybe VCH, but something like Ethereum, it's, it's not gonna, you're going to have a much bigger problem. Wouldn't you say that if, you, if you're looking at the BSV project, you're like, okay, this is what I want to build my thing on in the long run. Just the fact that you might realistically a few years down the road have to change everything over. Could, yeah, which to is which why point you is, grow, is, you've got to grow yeah. this too big to fail. Okay, so here's what I mean. Imagine Twitch is already three years of history of people's Twitch is stored on BSV. That is not being stored on the new chain, the new fancy chain that's like really yeah. amazing. That's not being stored on BCH. So you're losing history right there. So yeah. that company is not well incentivized to switch, even if something else better. But right now, there's not a lot of things on chain. So if we just wipe the chain, or something, switch something, it's not, I guess, not the hugest deal. Certainly no... Uh, it's a huge deal to me, okay, let's make that clear. But I'm just saying like, if you can get this chain to be used a lot more, bigger players will come in. Maybe CoinGeek's not even the biggest miner, okay? I'm just hypothetically just talking about this. And then whatever Craig wants to do, he can't do. And I think part of why he says things like this, I'm just guessing, is he says nobody can control Bitcoin, okay? Not even himself. He said that at, on a, left several interviews. So maybe he's testing that out as like an IQ test, like what Daniel Craywood says. He just makes whatever threats he wants to make. Uh, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. But, so that, that is an optimistic perspective. And that, that might be true because he said so many contradictory things. Surely he himself doesn't believe everything that comes out of his mouth. Now TK but, is excited. <laughs> we're talking about Craig. Uh, but but, but can't, can't you acknowledge though that that is still a liability? It's not like... Th like the, the actual court cases that he's dealing with and the fact that he's demonstrated he's willing to sue, he's willing to talk in front of a judge, and maybe he's willing to try to talk to a judge to say, I own the Bitcoin SV database. Can't we say that is at least a real risk? Because who knows what the courts are going to say, right? Steve this is a whole new domain to, for them. Steve wants you to be more concerned than you are, Jack. Steve is concerned for you and your business. Yes. I see, so, I, see a, I see a disaster scenario that I am maybe assigning more risk probability than, than you are. <laughs> TK, you answered that, yeah. <laughs> TK answers for Craig. Go ahead, TK. <laughs> No, but there, there's a, there is a weird extent to which, like, the degree to which you believe Craig and find his statements credible and believable increases, like, the more you believe that, the higher the risk to BSV. Like, if he's not as credible and those things are just wild statements that you don't really have to worry about, then BSV is, is less risky. But the, almost like the more credible Craig is, the higher risk BSV is because do, he's made so does, many crazy Does that things. mean, though, that you have to take a legal position? Like you have to inform yourself about the potential credibility of his claims legally in order to make the judgment call? I mean, I can't speak for Jack, but I, I don't think so, right? Like it's like starting any company. I think we've talked about this before. Even like just normal legal compliance is incredibly it's just impossible to ever fully know what makes sense. When, when we started Praxis, it was like, can you have an apprenticeship program where you're like having these people come through? And my original model that I wanted to do was you pay nothing and you go and you work for free for six months. And at the end of it, you're going to get you know, hired by this company. But working for free is illegal or at least kind of like we probably could have done it, but we would have been higher risk than if we didn't try to do that. And so I just sort of, and even after talking to three or four lawyers, 
I still couldn't tell. There was no black and white. It was like, well, you probably don't want to risk it. You don't know this could happen, but maybe this, but maybe this other thing. You could get a classified as an education. So I was like, okay, we're going to change our business model to mitigate that risk. Now, I'm, the risk isn't gone. Some, some regulation could shut us down for some other reason I never thought of. That kind of stuff is crazy. It's all, all the time. But you don't have to have a sure understanding. You just have to have, a, when you look at it, you have to be like, one, how reasonable is that? And two, it, why am I letting that hold me up? Because almost always, and this is what Jack sounded like he was saying, like, we're so small, we're so early. If I let myself worry about <laughs> what might happen legally down the road, I'd never start anything. I, I talk to people that are like, I have this company I want to start. It's brilliant. The problem is I can't raise investment or hire anyone because none of them will sign NDAs. And I don't want any of them to talk about my super brilliant idea because they might steal it. And I'm like, no, they won't. You're worried about someone stealing your idea that hasn't even proven itself yet. Don't worry. You're like, you got it all backwards. Should I register and trademark my name? No, start launching your freaking product first. That's way more important, you know? That, that, that's true, but, 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 but sometimes it can be reasonable to say, I'm not going to try to build this product because the risks could be great. So imagine, like with your Praxis example, imagine in the place that you incorporated, you knew there was some a di district attorney that was really trying to prosecute these people and he wanted to make a name of himself by throwing people like you in Thai prison. Yeah. You, or there was you, civil war in the streets or, or like, yeah, like, like maybe you BCH. don't want to build on it. Yeah. Like BCH looks riskier to build on as an entrepreneur because there's a culture of wanting to mess around with the protocol all the time. So, so Jack, how do you assess? Let's broaden the question. What do you see as the risks of building on BSV and how much do you think about those or how, how much weight do you put on those? Yeah, I think the longer BSV hangs out in third place by market cap, uh, the longer the risk continues to exist. I think you want to cut off all the risk, you get to number one in terms of proof of work uh, right now, uh, then, then you have much less risk. Uh, that's what I'm thinking about. because. In theory, we've been told a lot of things, right? Oh, the block having in May 2020, that's when like some some uh, cascading order hits the exchange, then this flips. <laughs> Rolling we clock iceberg. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, you, you have lots of lifelines, right? If that's, that happens, then I guess we don't have to build that many apps. It already, it already flipped or something. Or you have a combination of that, uh, some FOMO, some, some, some something else. Uh, some some segment uh, flaw that was going to be released right. in 2019, right? And then you're down to hard business, which is uh, uh, like the apps that are being built on Bitcoin. And then obviously, last time Derek was talking on your show about the the pure game released app list, and um, I, we we're, we are pure on there five or six times. Okay, so I, I would say that um, there's like relay one relay. Uh, I, I know you're a busy man with Relay and Dively and Stream Manager. You're all domain name. 36 projects. Wow. Yeah. That's done by one of my good friends in Korea, actually. I know who puts up the list uh, all the time. Uh, so he's, he's, a, he's a fan. But th th those are risks. And, uh, but I, you know, if you look at Elon Musk, right? And I'm, I'm not saying I'm a big fan of Elon Musk or anything like that. But when he started this space project, SpaceX, he had no idea the government was going to let him fly something into space. He could build it, but they might let, let him put a person in it. But he mitigates that risk by saying, okay, well, test, see this little, little test flight. See this, you know, now 10 years later, I'm allowed to fly a real human being. You, you put them in the I'm position fine. where where they would feel like they would lose face. They would be the a-hole to shut it down because now you've shown everybody how cool it is. So it's almost like build an app that's so cool that even if they could, Nobody on BSV wants to screw with it and shut you down. It's kind of like that. Exactly. And this is very similar to the talk you had with Roger, where, you know, the BCA strategy is we understand the future. We think we understand human rights. We think humans should do this right now. So we're going to let them do this right now because technology exists to allow you to buy Silk Road, do all this stuff right now. The BSV strategy, which is what I'm talking about, is do everything legal, do only legal things. And then as you progress, let's say, uh, tax as a percentage of GDP, 
starts declining because now states compete with each other, et cetera. And now all of a sudden, if you're the state, you don't want to be spending money on some of these things that uh, you know used to want to spend money on. Because people are going to revolt. They're like, why am I paying taxes? Like, why am I paying taxes for schools if uh, every single person is better off not going to the public schools? Then someone will run for election. Maybe there's no elections in lots of countries, but in the countries that they do have elections, there will be like a pro BSV candidate 20 years down the line. Just like there are now tech entrepreneurs, people want Mark Zuckerberg to run for president. People want Bill Gates to run for president. Mark Cuban to run for president. You play this game long enough, you will have Josh Petty as some kind of Indiana State candidate. Okay, that's where it's going to start. <laughs> okay, that kind of stuff. Okay, maybe I'm Arizona ready to move to Indiana. Huh? I'm ready to move to Indiana now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, so you know, if you already do this, like they go to Malta, they go to like Wyoming and whatever, it, whatever the case, Cayman Islands. So stay legal, make lots of users use your product in the millions and hundreds of millions. And just like Uber took the strategy to Capitol Hill, uh, in China, Taxi Hill is also approved, then you have a much more presentable case when people's lives, maybe even the government's income depends on on-chain tax revenues and stuff like this. Then who, there'll be like 100 million people. And I'm sure if Craig is Satoshi, and I believe he is, He's not going to ruin his legacy by, by something that doing something like that. That's not going to happen. He's going to be claimed as there's a reason they call the smallest unit Satoshi is so that when Bitcoin scales completely, adopt it completely, nobody on the street is going to say the word Bitcoin or BSV. They're going to say, oh, here's a banana, 700 Satoshis. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I, I, I would disagree that Craig or anybody wouldn't necessarily burn down the whole system. I mean, whoever Satoshi is, is going to have a bunch of uh, targets on his back, a bunch of people trying to attack him. And like, if Craig is Satoshi, he's obviously got a lot of vendettas against a lot of people. And it doesn't seem impossible that he would say, well, screw everybody. I'm just going to burn the whole system down. It's my way or the highway. And I'm not getting what I want. So I'm going to burn it or try to burn it down to the extent he can. But in, in, in that discussion or then in that, uh, uh, what you just said, it makes me think you have to have some legal analysis in Bitcoin. Like the fact of the matter is one way or another, if you're planning long-term, you have to have legal strategy or well, luckily, intuitions. Luckily, Craig has like seven law degrees. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but like you have to be playing, you at least have to be playing that game. And the fact that you have to have some legal strategy that includes predictions about what you think this guy Craig Wright can do legally and what he might do practically seems to me at least like um, a real risk that people in BSV tend to understate. I actually feel the exact same way about Omri Sachet. I remember getting, well, I still get a bunch of crap from people in BCH for, for my criticisms of Omri Sachet. I'm saying, look, if, just if you look at how the system is constructed, this one person has a lot of influence and he has a bunch of bad properties and we have to think about things in a in a inferior way because we have to incorporate judgments about what do we think about Amory Sachet. And I just get this the impression that you have you really have to do that with Craig and BSV as well. And I, I personally think that is a, a, a liability. Now I still am invested in BSV, so I don't think like in my judgment call in my legal analysis, I think he's full of shit about it a bunch of the time. I think he knows it. And I'm not concerned about Craig owning the database legally, but I, I just, I hope we get to the point where all of that stuff is over and the entrepreneurs can say, look, it's out of your hands, Craig. You're not really that relevant anymore. We've already built stuff on top of it. It's, it's game over. So a lot of people will say it, it already is over, but you just, you don't know it because you're just paying attention to the, to the noise uh, that really that stuff doesn't matter. And the, the real important stuff is, is just happening more quietly would you agree with that, Jack? Um, I, I won't say what's over and what's not, but I do think if you look at just events as a big symbolic thing, right? Um, the CoinGeek London conference represented to me the big thank you to Craig. You know, whether they brought George Gilder on, who's obviously elder in age, was one of Craig's inspirations. They brought... Um, 
Jimmy Wales on there. They brought a lot of people. They, every single person, whether you like CoinGeek or you don't like CoinGeek, showed up. Okay. There was a big union because this is the this was supposedly the last conference before this thing flipped BTC. Remember? That was the timing. <laughs> that was the uh, cascading iceberg order. Okay. So <laughs> this was the photo op. This was the thank you. This was the IQ test where it's like, hey, let me get into the photo. Let me, you know, you know, show that I was there. Let me timestamp that. Because like by the time May comes around, the mainstream is coming in and all that stuff. So I do think that I don't know. Uh, obviously, CoinGeek is an incredible company. They have a lot of resources. They could be still re very relevant for, for five, six years. It's almost like uh, those NBA players, right? Uh, is LeBron James still in his prime? Well, obviously not, okay? But he's in the prime in terms of ESPN getting views, so they tell you about LeBron James being a top two player, top three player, whatever. Uh, so I think you going forward are going to have to put CoinGeek or Craig in that light. Like, are there more, are there more crazy Bitcoin-like inventions coming next 20 years, or was it the last 20 years, right? So I think that apex moment was we said we would get it done. We got the scaling done to two gigabytes. We just a month earlier got it to Genesis, and then, voila, this is back in our headquarters of uh, CoinGeek and Chain, London. A thousand people turn out. Price happens to be cooperating. Also happens to be before coronavirus, whenever I have to stay home. So, so that's like the apex moment in, my, in terms of like the publicity, the, 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 the concentration. Let's uh, let's bring it home with a little discussion about um, the future. What are you? I know you're working on several things, as I mentioned, R Relay and and Dimely and now Streamanity. What is your kind of vision as an entrepreneur? Because I know you're not a programmer. You're more of a big visionary. Obviously, having your hand in all these various projects, you know, doing the the, the purchase of Streamanity. What do you see yourself doing next? Are you just going to replicate this and buy or build? more and more apps? Are you all in on the ones that you're currently working on? Are you trying to reduce the amount of stuff you're working on? What's your, what's your thinking? Um, what I'm thinking is uh, there's something special that's gonna happen in Bitcoin and I've always wanted to keep my slate clean, uh, cap tables clean for what I think will happen on Bitcoin. So, you know, uh, let me take a step back. If you worked at Coinbase, if you worked at uh, OKCoin or I guess not OKCoin, but Coinbase, um, this stamp, etc. You did not get a chance to do what Binance did uh, in terms of issuing a token, uh, doing ICO, because by that time you had like some investors that 40% of your company, they don't want you to have some new game that issues it to the users, etc. So you don't want to hamstring yourself because you, you learn from the lessons of the early internet. You could be Amazon and get to play the whole way out where today in 2020, you're very, very relevant. Or you could be like more like, I don't know, Ask Jeeves or Netscape. And then later on, it comes like Quora and like uh, Google Chrome. So uh, I think about what happens when Bitcoin is more fully adopted and is what I'm doing set up for that world. I don't want to set up wealth in today's world and then at some point have to stop. You know what I'm saying? So, um, the idea is not actually, well, I think there's a lot of misconception, which is they think maybe I'm some like money guy or something. I'm here running a boot camp here, build a wallet here. Oh, let's, let's pick fights on Twitter with these entrepreneurs. Let's throw some big punches. Watch this, put up Dimely. Okay, let's buy Shimani. That is not what the case is uh, at all. What actually is happening is um, there's a, connection to all these things that we're building. And maybe we built too many prototypes for now, but there is a way that we work internally that will allow these prototypes to mesh uh, and seamlessly do it. Because uh, you have to control the entire experience so that uh, if really wants to convince a Twitch or Baymail or the next app to come into our app store, we have to show how this is really going to look and how this is really going to work. And so by having like a, a case with Shinati, which is even more farther along, at least in Dimely, then uh, you can show that. You can show users uh, 
how can you get Bitcoin? How can you start watching videos? How can you put this stuff on chain? And then if that works, then obviously every other app wants that too, as it helps all your, all your projects. So I, th I think about it like that. And then I think about um, building things that will make, help other entrepreneurs do what I'm doing 10 times faster, 10 times better. Um, because as much as I, I work for the uh, improvement in the, I guess, company value of these projects, I also, like all of you guys, have some portion of Bitcoin. So it is obviously a lot more amplified if we can get 100 million people working in some ways on Bitcoin. And so, you know, I can see a day where one day our team meetings are, if I want to bug my engineer about something, I have to pay his rate uh, to talk to him because he doesn't want to hear my next big idea and what other feature we should be doing. He's got dinner to attend to, right? So this improves employee happiness or something like that. Um, I can see a world where uh, the promoters of our products are now making Streamanity videos to talk about them and the revenue share is already built in. So I don't have to worry about having an HR person pay that person for helping us. Like River has done a great job helping Float uh, do the uh, exchange marketing stuff. I, I, I want to give her a tip, but I don't know how much exactly it's supposed to be. So Bitcoin is going to make that a lot easier. And so that's why I'm less concerned about does my company look like Twitter or does it look like Google or does some other person want to invest or join us or whatever. I just want to build uh, the best thing that I can understand you can build on Bitcoin. I hope everyone else is doing that. And hopefully that, again, makes New England the best place to be and then everyone immigrates. That's my philosophy. You said you think Craig is Satoshi. Why? Uh, I thought this as soon as live on the day, I must have been one of the first 50 viewers of that last Vegas video uh, where he comes on from some screen, okay? Uh, you guys have seen this, right? Yeah, oh yeah. If YouTube wants to open up the tape, I'm pretty sure I'm on the first 50 views of that video because it came onto Reddit. I was blogging about Bitcoin, so I watched this. And obviously, I don't know lots of things about Bitcoin, but I was assuming all these people on stage and everyone else knows about Bitcoin or the technical people. So when someone else comes in and says something so ridiculously different, then that makes me think. Then I see the people arguing after the tape came out about here's why he was wrong, here's why he was right, et cetera. I'm more of a possibilities type of guy. So I think less of his claims about degrees or whatever. And I think about the Turing complete stuff. I know Ryan X. Charles later on made a video about explaining that, but it's more just reading faces, reading body language. Um, if Nick Zabo was absolutely right in that it's not Turing complete, that he would have immediately responded to that. Because at that time, remember, Nick Zabo was assumed maybe by lots of people to be Satoshi, right? So I see his facial reaction. He did not respond like, uh, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. Here's why it's not. Here's why Turing complete would be wrong. Here's why that would be bad for Bitcoin. Whatever Turing complete is, right? That's how I'm looking at it. He responded like, I've never heard this before, but I don't want to seem like a guy who is upped by somebody else technically. So I need to say something. And so that just made me realize, okay, that's something. And then I followed the, the, the next things he did. And, and, and so I, I think by 2016, my predictions in 2016 were just Donald Trump is going to win presidency and Craig Wright is Satoshi. That's it. Wow. That, that's funny. That, that video is, is really great. And I think that for me, uh, uh, I saw that, um, the talk you mentioned earlier in uh, Arnhem or whatever, when yes. this when this block debate stuff was was heating up, and I, I had been talking to Steve about it and start you know just feeling like, like am I a crazy person that this just seems so stupid that these people are arguing for small blocks? Like what are they talking about running these nodes, whatever? Like because Steve had helped me see that, and that talk I remember I shared it in this Facebook group I used to be in that was like a like crypto libertarian investment, whatever. It was when the, during the bull market, so everyone thought they were smart because they were, you know, getting rich off of coins. And I was like, okay, this dude seems a little crazy, but like, I, you know, I didn't pay much attention when he did that thing in 2015 and everybody said they debunked it. But 
this kind of seems Satoshi like to me. Like that was the yeah. first time I like, I had that, what you said, like there was something about reading it, something in my gut that was like, huh, this guy yeah. isn't, he's a little crazy, but I don't want to dismiss him completely. I think people are, are missing a little something here. Now, I don't know uh, if he is or he isn't, but there's something about him that's definitely more than just a complete moron or scammer. And I wrote on my uh, WeChat in 2016, I said to a friend, because uh, I had, at that time, gone to all these skating debates, met all these famous people in Bitcoin, et cetera. And then one of my friends at OK asked me, what would you give to have dinner with Satoshi? And then he had no idea I believed it was Craig. So I said, well, I think Satoshi's Craig, and I think I will get a chance one day. That's my goal, to have dinner with Craig. And that, that, obviously, I've since had five to 10 dinners, I'd say, with, uh, with Craig. And so that's been fun. Um, and I'll caveat everything I'm saying by saying that even in the slightest possibility that he is not Satoshi, to me, I just think of it as he's a spokesperson for Satoshi. Because the things he's saying would be what Satoshi would actually believe. So then I'm perfectly hedged whether he is or not in my, in my understanding. That, that's an interesting way to put it. TK, you kind of say something similar sometimes about like who has the most Satoshi-ness is like a separate question from who is Satoshi. <laughs> Yes. I can't oh, hear you're, you. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. Where, where I think a lot of people get it wrong is they focus on who sounds smarter rather than who is being more honest to the vision that allows Bitcoin to live. And sometimes you know who to trust, not based on who sounds smart, but based on who's speaking the words that tend towards life. So, so there's this really interesting story. I'll tell it very quickly. Sorry, TK, that tends towards life, did you say? That tends toward life. And I'll explain what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, I'll tell I you, just, Steve. I love how religious that is. Yes, he's fully immersed in that. To, to really, listen, if you really understand BSV, you become a religious fanatic. That's, the, that's the, how it yes. goes. That's what, all, that's what I've heard. Well, well, well I'm going to even get more religious because there's a great story from the Bible that, to me, captures what it's like to compare Craig to other people. So, so King Solomon, who's said to be the wisest, you know, person to ever live, th there's a conflict that's brought before him. There are two women who are having a fight with each other over who is the mother of a baby. Both of them had newborns. One of the mothers basically slept on her baby and, and killed her baby while she was asleep. The other mother, and then she went and stole someone else's baby. So they're having a fight about this. They tell Solomon their story. And he's trying to figure out who is the real mother of the child. And he says, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to cut the baby in half. And you take one half of the baby and you take the other half. And the one woman says, oh, no, I, 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 we can't have that. Just let her have the baby. I'm willing to let her have the baby so that the baby might live. And the other woman says, that sounds like justice. That's the right thing to do. You know, so be it. And then at that moment, Solomon recognizes, all right, this is the true mother, the one that is allowing, the, the one that is willing to give up the child in order that the child might live is the true mother, not the one with this elaborate story about, you know, justice or whatever it may be. And I feel like Craig is the true mother in that he is willing to give up. <laughs> I'm just going to excerpt you saying Craig yes. is the true mother Do it. and then edit in like a big Next, part. yeah. That will be a successful stream. Clip. A lot of money. So thank you exactly. very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Craig is the true mother of Bitcoin in that he is the one that's making the choice. When you look past all the words and all the smart sounding technical talk, he's the one that's making the choice that's going to allow what he created to live, even if it comes at his own expense. And that's exactly what we see happening. Other people sound smarter. They use the rhetoric of, I care about this. I care about that but the actual choices they are making are the ones that result in the baby dying. When you said the true mother, I immediately thought, <laughs> I, immediately guys, thought I, I thought the mother of dragons, you know, cause BSB has chosen this dragon logo and I was thinking game of Thrones and like, Oh yeah, the mother of dragons, she's coming to liberate everybody. Oh yeah. But then she like went crazy and destroyed everything with her dra <laughs> with her dragons. Like, man, maybe Craig is the, the mother of dragons. <laughs> So, so I want to give an alternative interpretation. I mean, maybe Craig is the mother of Bitcoin. It's possible. But I, there are other options here. One is... He is Bitcoin's mother and father. It was immaculately conceived. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, and he he is the immaculate conception himself. <laughs> uh, so so there's something. Okay, so humans are these weird creatures, weird social animals, and we all have uh, intuitions that can be very good most of the time. But every once in a while, there's so many humans that exist, we get an anomaly of a human that has properties that we find uh, attractive or we really don't like them. Like we really have feel strongly about this person one way or another. Um, so the term con man, it, it means confidence man. And it's like somebody that can, you know, take advantage of others precisely because they have a level of confidence in what they're talking about that is beyond normal. It, it's like somebody has so much confidence to go, oh, this guy has to know what he's talking about. Like nobody would see such outrageous and ambitious things if they didn't know what they, <laughs> what they were talking about. So that is precisely how some con men can manage to be so effective is because they're anomalies that have this magical ability to convey confidence when they don't actually, but let's say they're not who they present themselves to be. There's a possibility here that Craig is that. And, and I remember watching the video you're talking about in 2016 or whenever it was, and he's on the screen. And I thought, okay, this person is definitely uh, communicating, though not explicitly, that they are on a different level of understanding than others. And that could be because he's on a different level of understanding than others, or it could be because he's actually like one of those anomalies. He's the con man, the confidence man. Hey, just really quickly. He happened Steve. to be right about that, that confident proclamation, which, which helps his case, but he hasn't always been. So, hey, Steve, just really quickly, you remind me of those people who try to get me to stop liking Michael Jordan by telling me all these horror stories of how he was a jerk to a teammate or punch Steve Kerr in the face. And every time people bring that stuff up, it just makes me like him more. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think the origin of con man is actually someone who is able to get others to have confidence in them, right? And that, be, that might be because they project so much confidence, but to, yeah. win, to win the trust of people, they'll put their confidence in you. Like my, my favorite example of this, oh, what the heck is his name? I've used this example Frank, before. Frank Abagnale? Frank Abagnale. Jeez, thank you. Um, the, the catch me if you can guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. He like went He's, around. He lives here in Charleston in, where I live. Fascinating story. And the way that he did it, he, he was playing a game that almost no humans can play. They're just not in their genetic code to be able to lie like that, which meant he was enabled to, you know, to do a lot of crazy things. He's got this amazing story. And I think it's entirely possible that Craig is playing that role. But like you said, Jack, there's something that's, that's nice about Craig in that even if he's bullshitting a lot of this and doesn't know what he's talking about, I think he's, if we play out the con man story, he's done enough reading of Mike Hearn and others where he says a lot of correct things, so importantly and subtly correct things that people miss out on. So even if he's just playing this silly role, the net impact could still be a positive thing, even if he is a comment. So th there's a detail in, in the, the story uh, that TK told, the biblical story, that you didn't mention. And if I remember correctly, that Solomon says, even if you're not the biological mother, you're the one who is the true mother of this child and ought to have the child because you're saying the thing that matters, you're saying the right thing. And, and there's just something, there's something the thing interesting that tends about towards it. life. Yeah, that towards life. Jack, uh, we're going to give you the last word and it can be about anything. You, you endured our, our um, <laughs> colorful religious conversation or whatever you want to call that. So we're going to let you bring us home with whatever you want. Yeah, sure. I just want to, you know, the news of the day is really we have taken over uh, humanity and I am not an expert, neither is my team expert on video platforms and, and how to get, and all this stuff, this stuff. So bear with us. We're going to add a lot of features to this over time. And we want to thank, one thing you know will stay the same is that we're going to keep on encouraging people who have already used Shunai to keep on using Shunai better, make your experience better. Um, thank you, uh, Isaac, TK, and uh, Steve. For, and also Derek, for putting your shows on Streamanity. I want to know, rather than me having the last word, you guys just keep saying a, a, a piece each about what, what makes you want to use Streamanity more? What features do you need? Because you're going to set the example. You're going to be the biggest video. This is going to be the biggest video today, at least, on Streamanity when it's posted. So 
That's easy. Uh, I, I, I want my dollar back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's a good question because that's, a, that's almost a harder question for us than I think it might be for many creators because we, we explicitly started recording these conversations purely selfishly and we have maintained throughout, we're only going to do this if it's fun and we're not going to do it if it ceases to be fun. And we're not going to turn this into some formalized podcast, whatever, unless that seems fun. Um, and so we just flipped record and I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I had any videos on my YouTube channel. I just didn't know where to post it. Uh, everybody's on YouTube. So I just posted it to YouTube and like maybe tweeted it once. And we've had, you know, a lot in the Bitcoin community, uh, especially BSV, but BCH to a lesser extent, a lot of shares and a lot of discussion. And it's been really fun. So for me, there's usually the conversation itself is the reward. And then when I post it in the immediate day or two, there's like the fun dopamine hit of seeing crazy comments come in or seeing retweets or seeing views. So if I were to post, you know, th this is going to be only, this, this video is going to be only on Streamanity. It's a Streamanity exclusive. We're not going to put it on YouTube. If I post this there and it gets like one view and nobody responds and it feels like nobody watched it, that will, it will feel less energizing to me. Even though that's not the main reason, that's like a bonus. That's like the cherry on top. When people like our videos, it makes it a lot more fun to have the conversations. Um, so really it's like, or, or, or money, right? Like money works too, right? When you're on Twitch, even though it's only a couple bucks, having somebody click like pay $2, thanks, this was really great. That's like a huge like little dopamine hit. And you're like, oh, this is fun. Somebody likes it. Somebody values it. It's like when someone sends you a thank you email. It, it, it means yeah. something. So to me, um, having the conversation is the real, is the real reward. It's the fun part. Posting it on Streamanity, if it's nothing but crickets, that would suck. If there's action and traction on it, that will be a bonus. Great. I will give a 10 second reply to that. We will have an option where you can post for free. And then you, the next question is how am I going to cover our cost if you're going to post for free? Well, similar to weather SV, you're going to be able to pay a little bit with a swipe or whatever to keep your video on humanity or your fans can keep it to keep it there so that we cover our server cost plus a little bit of uh, margin. So that if you want to go for that conversation game, we're going to let you go for the conversation game. And then we're going to think about uh, ways for the creators to make more money if they want to go for the monetization game. I love okay. that. I mean, I, I don't have strong opinions on, um, on like specifically for us right now, you know, what, 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 what would incentivize us to use the platform. But, but, but Steve, say, you create a ton of content elsewhere. Yeah. What would, what would that mean? But yeah, but I, so, so I'm not, I'm not, as you know, Isaac, because because you guys always uh, tell me I could really take my project farther. Like I'm not big on the monetizing what I'm doing right now. My goal is like personally find out what the truth is. I got a particular method for doing so that's worked well for me. And I just need to make enough money to continue what I'm doing so that I can sit in the bathtub and think. Like, so, so I'm, I, I would be an odd case for this. Maybe someday I'll try to monetize a little bit more, but just from a, from a strategic and conceptual perspective, uh, the idea of rethinking video hosting incentives is so attractive. Like what you just described, like if you like this video, Hey, you know, uh, when you spend a like, it's the 10 cents, part of that pays for humanity and part of that pays for the hosting cost to keep the video up. That kind of stuff is so exciting to rethink. Yeah, like here's the minimum threshold that needs to be met to keep hosting this video. And if you don't want it to disappear, kick, kick in a few cents or a few bucks. Yeah, and if you think about it, like the, the YouTube model is, well, I, I don't have to pay anything. I could just consume my content and that's the way it should be. But that's not clear that's the way it should be. If you have fans that enjoy your stuff, I guarantee if, if it costs 10 cents to hit the like button and, and people were onboarded and had their money button and it's like they, are, they don't think about the money, everybody's going to do that. They're going to love it. They're going to click three times. They're like, yeah, that was a great video. I'll support hosting because I want to see it more. That's really exciting to me. And you can self-pay too. If you're just uploading something you know no one, not for the fans, but for yourself, you can self-pay. And we won't be ruthless. We won't be like, oh, you missed your deadline by a day and then your bill is gone. It's going to be like one of those like, you know, the phone bills. You're overdue on your phone bill. You know, maybe you can't call anymore, but the moment you clear your bill, your, your calling comes back, that kind of thing. So I just think uh, streamality obviously right now is a daily losing 
money company. It's not a lot, but it loses a little bit because the, the revenues does not cover their the hosting and, and, and this kind of stuff. But it, it's, it's, it just gives, whether it's me or someone else, a chance to tinker with that model. And I think uh, we'll give that a shot. TK, do you have any words? Well, I, I have a question for you about the hosting. Um, I've heard some conflicting reports about where the videos are actually hosted. It, are the videos on the blockchain and I have portability or, or is this private hosting? How, how does that work? The videos are not on the blockchain. Okay. Uh, don't, don't be average at me. That wasn't my decision. <laughs> but I do think that at some point, uh, you know, whether it's our competitor or something, they're going to, someone's going to put up uh, on-chain hosting and that could be a, a choice too. So it's going to most likely be a lot more expensive. Even rates come down a lot. Uh, but you could you could potentially you know pick a clip or something uh, that uh, you want to keep on chain. Maybe we can have a dual option on the on the platform. Um, and maybe for discovery reasons, we could have links to the video on chain so people can like just different browsers can find these videos. But uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I I just think that's a for me personally. It, it's not like I demand that in order to use it. I, I plan on having fun and playing around. But I think that's one of the most interesting possibilities of doing video on the blockchain because we're seeing so much censorship. You never know who's going to be in power. And it's like, man, some of these people are lucky enough to get their YouTube channels back. But if they just take it dark on you and they usually don't give any warnings or they come really fast, it's like, man, you just lost an entire library of stuff, especially if you use that to back it up. So, yeah, I, well, I would love would... to see yeah. What would the economics have to be like, you know, when, when does that become feasible? You know what I mean? Like, this is like a two hour conversation. So uploading this, I don't even know what this would cost. Uh, I have no idea what Fortune. the file size would be, but probably a few hundred dollars, right? Yeah. So when does that get down to a few dollars or a few cents? I does think it? what I've heard from what people are suggesting is very basic. Um, well, last year, someone posted the Craig Wright Australia interview with uh, Dale uh, from uh, Meta, Meta TV. So that cost, I think, like $500 uh, to post. Like, that would be 40 minutes long. Maybe it's just have gotten cheaper now, but not much cheaper. So I could see something where the, the video is on the blockchain for a period of time, like a certain number of blocks, and then dedicated service providers take those videos and build like an archiving ser service, right? So then you're not necessarily at the risk of streamality, having a glitch or having a, a negative problem where we just take it off, but it's at the market to store these videos so that you can have competing providers because the video will first exist on chain for a little while. I could see that being the model. Yeah, and I wonder how, uh, how much resolution makes a difference here. I used to do video editing and stuff for, I was working for a nonprofit and the difference in file size between when you're doing a 720p video versus, you know, 240 or whatever the lowest setting is on uh, YouTube, it's enormous. So maybe for a while, while costs are high, the quality of the on-chain videos are going to be extremely low, I would imagine. Yeah. It's not clear to me that if you made this thing on chain, this show, and then it was more blurry, that there'll be more users because the users certainly don't care when this video right. is being hosted. Right. right. Exactly. So, um, the numbers are so low, uh, at, on streamality in terms of total users, total videos, et cetera, that I think there's a whole bunch of ways we can improve before we hit to that barrier where it's like, Hey man, if this stuff is not on chain, then we're not going to use this anymore. Yeah. I almost wonder if you could have a, when you upload your video, it's like, um, also, also put this video on chain, yes. here's the cost and the cost is insane. But if you're somebody that has some, maybe it's a two minute video of an <laughs> sure. interaction with a cop or whatever, and you sure. want to make sure it's on chain and you want to pay the 10 bucks, 50 bucks, a hundred bucks, um, you can, and then eventually maybe that goes down over time. But, uh, very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, hey, man, Great. thanks so much for taking the time to, to come on and chat with us. It was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you guys for the time and uh, let, let's hopefully make some money. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a yeah. lot for coming. Good man, Jack.